So I'm Catherine Robinson, and I'm here to talk to you today about five levels of global readiness. Um, welcome to the Global Leadership Day. This is a great conference. I'm so glad to be a part of it. Um, I want to take a minute just to shout out to the program sponsors and supporters. You can see them listed here. Um, it's great to have supporters in this field of education and global ed, and so I'm, I'm glad that we have all these great folks behind us. Before I start on um, my portion of the presentation, I wanted to see if you all could let us know where you are joining us from. So there's a map of the world here, and you have a little um, starburst looking icon that you can click on, and then click on the map to show us where you're logging in from. So I've put my, uh, my face there in North Carolina. It's a big face. It's taking up about three states right now. But if you can do the same, you can click on your icon, give yourself a pointer or a smiley face, and tell me on the map where you're coming from. I see someone from Florida has put in the chat box. Um, here's another star. Looks like someplace in the northeast or mid-Atlantic. Um, Virginia, OK, there we go. And then I know we have someone from Minnesota, Minnesota too. Um, OK, and there's something else, um, somebody else coming in. So great. Thanks for letting me know, and thanks for being here. So I said our, my presentation is on um, this idea of the five levels of global readiness. Um, and I'm approaching this from my perspective in North Carolina, but I think that there are takeaways that you can apply to um, you know, just about any state in different ways. Um, so hopefully those of you coming from other states will have some good things that you can learn from, from what we're doing here in North Carolina. And also think about this as an overall concept of how you can consider global ed at uh, multiple levels in terms of a school, a district, and so on. So here are the five levels of global readiness that I'm talking about. Um, we have the state level at the top, followed by the district, school, classroom, and the individual educator. And um, we're going to go through and just have a couple of talking points on each of these levels. And I'll let you all know um, what we do to try to foster global readiness and global education in our state. Um, and while I'm going through this, um, if you can chime in on the chat room of what your role is. Um, are you a teacher, an administrator, um, central office, school-based? Are you at a university? Um, are you a pre-service teacher? Whatever your role is, let me know in that chat box, and that'll help me know um, who I'm talking to. So the first level we're going to talk about is this kind of higher, top-down level of the state level of global readiness. Um, before we dive into that, I want to just call up this quote for you all to take a look at. You can read over it, and um, as you're reading it, think about think about who you who might have said this, who said this quote. Um, and it there's you know a spoiler at the bottom. You can see who who said this quote, but see if that rings true for what you might have pictured. If you're seeing this quote in isolation, you know you might think something like UNICEF or um, an uh, international nonprofit, um, a, a World Affairs Council, something like that. But in reality, this quote is a quote from the Department for Education and Skills in the UK. Um, and you see a lot of focus on global readiness and global education in other parts of the world. But those things are not always focal points within our own nation. Uh, the US, it's uh, such, a, such a large nation very diverse, and a lot of times we focus on understanding ourselves, on our own history, um, our own interactions, and we have a little bit more insular of a viewpoint than many other countries of the world have. A lot of other places know more about us than we know about them. So fortunately for um, us in North Carolina, global education has been named something that is very important for our state. Um, and for those of you for other states, you can kind of consider and think about, do you think that global education is something that in your state is recognized as being important? Um, our state has said that it is something that's important, and we actually had established a task force, task force at the State Board of Education level that was formed to, um, to help us understand and appreciate other countries, other languages, and other cultures. Um, these are the findings that I thought I'd share with you from that state level. Um, and then there are some specific kind of um, goals and takeaways. 
the six major findings, the first is that um, we were kind of having this discussion of preparing students for the future, preparing for the next century, and and we we realized we had to stop framing it in that way. Um, North Carolina is global today. We If we're not doing it right now, we're falling behind. And the second finding is basically moving away from pilot programs into comprehensive approach that are preparing students uh, routinely every day right now. So we can't just have new initiatives um, that you try one time and then are replaced with something something else we need to do have a comprehensive approach. The third finding from the task force is that we um, need to prepare teachers. And so we can't expect teachers to prepare their students without having the global knowledge themselves. The fourth finding um, was that North Carolina historically had been a leader in language learning, but we had fallen off from that um, from that leadership standpoint. And so we really want to focus on language learning um, and return to that leadership place. Um, the fifth finding was that schools need peers and partners to move forward. So schools have so many things on their plates that they need to have international partnerships. Um, government partnerships, partnerships with schools and colleges of education that can help move them and their teachers forward. And then finally, if it's not sustainable, it's not a strategy. Um, we, need, um, we need money, we need resources, we need to have a mechanism to support global education that is really a sustainable um, component of the schools. So the recommendations came with these five specific recommendations. Um, the first is robust teacher support and tools. So again, supporting those, those teachers. Um, the second was that focus on language that I mentioned to you. The third were new school models, whether those be independent schools, charter schools. Um, we have magnet schools, lots of magnet schools in North Carolina, schools of choice. And so there's lots of different ways that you can have this new school model, um, both in and out of the public system. And then number four is district networking and recognition. So basically, their school districts need to be in support of their teachers and their schools in this mission um, and need to be able to recognize teachers who accomplish uh, global ed in their classes. Um, and then finally, strategic international relationships need to be pursued. So we have um, sister city relationships. We have formal partnerships with other countries. Um, and these international relationships help support schools in their mission. OK, so let's talk about the district level next. Um, in North Carolina, we have a, a very diverse state, um, as, as most states are. This is a snapshot for those of you who might be less familiar with North Carolina. We have 100 counties in North Carolina. And the blue that you're seeing on this map is a snapshot of global engagement. And so those counties that are a darker blue, um, they have higher levels of, of global engagement than the counties that are that lighter blue color. Um, and so I'm coming from to you from, um, from Orange County. Um, our capital is in Wake County. Um, Duke is in uh, Durham County. And so that's kind of all right in here, um, which we call the triangle in North Carolina. So you can see a lot of that global engagement through universities, through businesses, through um, an international airport. Those are all things that help kind of make a globally minded and globally engaged county. The Charlotte area, which is our biggest city, is down here. So you can see, again, that darker blue around major cities. And then as you get further from the cities, you have that lighter blue. So this engagement, varying levels of engagement with the world can be mirrored in lots of states. And that means that global education is going to look different in all of these districts. So the districts with kind of with more international students or families, they have natural pockets of resources in their counties. But those districts that might be more rural, um, they, they might not have as many international resources at their fingertips. So they're looking for other unique, unique ways to bring the world to their students. So for this reason, the state has given districts some ownership level over um, what, they, what they can do in terms of global ed and how they can bring the world to their students. The districts have a fair amount of decision making abilities. I wanted to just throw up this slide to show you, again, what I'm talking about when I say global engagement. It's things like the percentage of foreign-born um, people in the population, um, international businesses, partnerships, events, um, festivals, things like that. Those are all level, different levels of global engagement. 
And then here is also you can see uh, these are some of North Carolina's, the foreign owned firms that are operated in North Carolina. We have over 700 in our state. Um, and you probably have many of these operating in your state as well. Um, these are all these are all companies that bring work, that bring jobs, that bring money into the economy, and they're all internationally affiliated companies. Um, I'll point out one specifically to you. Well, Food Lion, first of all, was a, was a North Carolina um, developed and owned company until it was sold to a company um, in Belgium, and so now it's an international company. Funny enough. Um, and then the other one I wanted to point out to you is this um, this image for Haichu. If has anyone ever had a Haichu candy? If you haven't, it's really good. High recommend. You can find them at, um, like, most Targets will have Haichu. It's kind of like a mixture of a Starburst and an Airhead. Um, anyway, it's really good. It's from Japan, from the Morinaga Candy Company. Um, and this, the Morinaga Candy Company actually just opened their first um, ever uh, plant, like manufacturing plant, in North Carolina. The first ever on the East Coast was in North Carolina, um, in Orange County in Mebane. And so that's a brand new international business that's operating here um, that, again, is bringing um, international engagement uh, to, to our state. And then, of course, you see our international engagement in our schools. We have over 300 different languages spoken in the homes of our students. Um, some languages you might know or have come across, things like Spanish, French, German, or Mandarin. And some languages you may or may not have um, been introduced to, um, languages like Farsi, Gujarati, Shona, or Tagalog, all languages spoken in our schools um, and by our students here in North Carolina, making up very diverse classrooms. So let's go to that third level of global readiness, um, and that's the school level. So we're kind of, you know, we've had the state, um, the state's findings, their task force, their, um, their goals, and then the fact that our districts are going to take these goals, but they're going to apply them differently based on what the district looks like. So what does it actually look like when you're in a school? When we're talking to schools about global education and global readiness, what do we want to see? So this is something that I want you all to consider, and you feel free to chime in in the chat room if you have any thoughts or takeaways from any of these slides. Um, this quote here, in an era of ubiquitous interconnection, global awareness does not mean simply learning about other cultures, foods, and holidays. So we work with a lot of schools who have, who say to us, you know, we are a global school, we, um, we love global education, we have an international festival every year. And we say, that's great. Please have your international festival, celebrate different cultures, but you have to do more. Um, we need to go beyond just celebrating another culture's food, holidays, and we need to go deeper into the curriculum. We want everything we do in terms of if you do serve um, food from another from another country or another culture to tie that to the curriculum. Say, um, you know, what is what does this say for fair trade? Um, what implications are there for agriculture? Um, if you're if you're, you know, health and science teacher, you can talk about nutrition. You really can connect things to any discipline, but you want to just go beyond serving, having taco night for the sake of eating tacos. You also want to talk about the country, the culture, and the people in deeper and more meaningful ways. So an analogy that we use to, um, to talk about this with schools is the difference between travel and tourism. So a tourist is someone who experiences disconnected sights and sounds and enjoys them uh, without drawing meaning. A traveler is someone who roams the earth, digests what he sees and hears, and collects them in a framework of understanding, which he both brings to his travels and deepens with travels. The former is pleasant interlude in your life. The latter is about life itself. So we are always encouraging schools to make sure they are striving to be at that traveler level. Rather than just looking at flags from around the world or eating food from around the world, you really are considering what are you seeing, what are you eating, and how can I think critically about um, people and places all around the world. So um, we, what we try to do is to encourage um, educators either to stay away from or to go deeper with the five F's. And if you've ever heard of the five F's of global education, they are food, flags, festivals, fashion, famous people. You can see my little cute little clip art down there. 
So um, the five S of global ed are the things that are sometimes um, thrown up on a poster or on a PowerPoint um, and said, okay, we're global now, we've, we've done one of these five Fs. But really alone, they're not enough. Um, and they're kind of that tourist level um, in terms of global engagement. So, but like I said before, it's not just abandoning the international festival or the five Fs, but you can really take these things and go deeper. So if you um, talk about flags, you know, you don't just want to display flags and say, yeah, I'm a global school. We have flags displayed all over our school. Um, but instead, you can you can talk about what is the meaning behind a flag? Why are these colors represented? What do they mean to this people? Um, was there any type of conflict or liberation? Does that play into the flag? And then you can see how those more meaningful connections in terms of um, citizenship you can discuss or democracy um, or conflict. And then if you, um, if you're, if I know that some folks here are elementary level, and if you're with younger students, you can kind of take it in a different route and look at things like shapes. What shapes do you see? Um, you can look at, um, at different at types of flags and, and explore um, art through coloring flags, through designing your own flag that represents you. And so you can really kind of take something like an F of a flag, this 5F tourist level idea, and take it into um, a more meaningful and deeper discussion for your students. So just to kind of go over, again, this tourist traveler idea, in a tourist school, a teacher is a tour guide. Students may be shown things that are exotic or unfamiliar, um, focusing on differences rather than similarities. And so you can see this picture I have here. Uh, this is a picture from India of two snake charmers. So this is a very exotic thing, um, something you wouldn't see on the streets of North Carolina or you know, anywhere in the US. Um, in a tourist school, classrooms will quickly return to the regular curriculum. International guests and partners are not contacted. The connections made are surface level, and the school-wide events focus on the 5Fs. So again, that international festival with those 5Fs, but that don't have those deeper, more meaningful connections. So a traveling school, um, here's how it looks a bit different. The journey takes longer. Um, there are email or virtual communication between um, the classroom, classrooms and international partners. Um, the studies include history, geography, tradition, art, economics, politics, um, you know, every facet that you can include in your curriculum based on what you're teaching from another culture. International teachers and guests might be contacted. And students are engaging in language study, um, if that's available at their school. And then finally, the teacher is a fellow explorer who brings learning skills and experience on a shared journey. So you can see the picture I have here. If you just had this up standalone, no um, background to it, then it's also kind of that tourist level picture. You know, you have this painted elephant. You don't know really what's going on. But the way you turn this into a traveler type uh, picture or part of the conversation is to talk about the history here. So history of kings in India riding on elephants um, to try to intimidate um, intimidate others who they might be in conflict with. And then um, the, the genesis of elephants being painted to look even more impressive and beautiful. So you can see how you can take um, something and go a little bit deeper with it, um, be it through art or history or, um, or politics or culture. And then finally, I want to put up this idea for the global school. So this is kind of that gold standard, um, what you're striving for in a school or classroom, where students are working on collaborative, collaborative projects with classrooms abroad, um, studies of cultures or issues are in-depth. Um, you focus on co complex issues and contradictions, you know, no stereotyping. Um, schools are practicing skills for democracy and citizenship, so you're not just learning facts, but also practicing the skills you need to um, implement those facts and think critically. Students are able to communicate through world languages or new technologies, and students are experiencing and exploring multiple perspectives. And so this picture I have here, this is a classroom in India that um, we visited, visited with educators um, and then connected with on a, in an ongoing way. And so this is a real classroom, real students. This is their teacher you can see in front. Um, and uh, doing some type of collaborative project, project with them would be a great global, um, a global endeavor for that classroom. OK, so let's move to the fourth level. And I want to share with you some uh, resources that you can use in your classroom. Um, I'm going to show you these resources through this three-tiered approach of content, context, and contact. So the content are, is the stuff you have to teach, the facts, the data, the text you have to read, information. Um, context is the bigger picture. So how do you inspire understanding among students? 
And then contact is how do you how do you connect with partners or colleagues inter internationally? How do you add that human personal element? So I'm going to show you um, a couple of resources for each C, the first being content. So this is actually a resource that uh, we developed in our office here at UNC Chapel Hill. Um, and this is called a, uh, a foreign currency kit. So we collected bills and coins from all over the world. We actually asked our student body who were traveling abroad to donate this currency to us. And we got a lot of great donations. This is something that you can recreate at your school or classroom or university. Um, and using this currency, we um, created lesson plans. We purchased books that can accompany them. And this is a kit that we mail out to, to teachers that you can use in the classroom. Um, you can see this, this currency kit can be used in math, even at a really young age level to look at things like shapes. Um, you can use small currency for counting or addition and subtraction. And then you can, um, you can also use this with older students to talk about kind of the history of the currency and what's going on um, in the country that you're looking at. There's really interesting changes going on in our country right now with currency and the new um, and Harriet Tubman on the $20 bill. And so that is also another way, again, with older students to bring this back to their, um, their present day and their and current events. The next resource I want to share with you, which is another content resource, um, is the International Children's Digital Library. If you've never heard of this, this is a great free website where you can read and access books from around the world, books written in multiple languages, but also a lot of international books written in English um, that you can access online, great high quality pictures that you can read um, right from your computer screen or your students can read. These are two that I wanted to show you. Um, one from India that's actually also translated into Spanish, so that's really cool. And then the second one is from Kenya, and that's like a, a graphic novel type of story. And I wanted to just share this, this statistic that comes um, from Kids and Family Reading Report, that children say that one of the top things they look for in choosing a book to read is having characters that look like me. It is so important for us to have diverse books for our students. So this is one resource where you can access them for free. The next content resource I want to share with you, the last one, is a website called The Newseum. Um, if you're familiar with The Newseum, it's actually a museum in Washington, DC. Some of you from Virginia may have been there with students, possibly. Um, but if you can't travel there with students, you can also access their resources online. They have front pages from around the world. They have lesson plans, posters. And I want to show you an example now of how they can illustrate different perspectives from around the world based on the news. So this is a front page that I pulled from their website from when Pope Francis visited the US. And you can see the, web, the title here of the article, A Capital Jubilee, it's from the Washington Post Express. Pretty positive, benign, you know, um, general and vague title. So here's another um, front page that I pulled. This is from a newspaper in Texas. And this title, you can see it's still front page news. We still have the Pope's picture here up top. Um, a warm welcome is the head title. But the subtitle is, Pope stirs excitement in DC, calls for climate action. So the interesting thing about that is you can see a little bit more of a perspective here. Um, there's this issue of climate action is touched on by this newspaper in Texas. OK, now let's go internationally. This is a newspaper front page, again, that I pulled from the same day. Um, and this is a paper, newspaper from Nicaragua. And you can see, this, again, the picture of the Pope and President Obama's front page news. Um, and the title of that is Papa es Esperanza de Migrantes en Estados Unidos, basically, abbreviated. And if you don't speak Spanish or read Spanish, the basic translation is um, the Pope is the hope of migrants in the US. So you can see a really interesting perspective here. There are a lot of. Um, there's a lot of immigration between Nicaragua and the US. And so obviously, the readers in Nicaragua of this newspaper would be interested in this, in this um, point, in this component, the fact that the Pope is talking about immigration when he's in the US. So again, a really interesting perspective. And so um, there's a question, are these being pulled digitally? Yes, you can just right click on the images in, on the Newseum website, and it's newseum.org. You can right click on those images and save it to your computer or copy and paste it into a document very easily. OK. Let's move on to context. And again, this is the bigger picture. 
And so when you're talking about inspiring context you want to, or building context, you want to inspire that understanding among your students. So one tool you can use to do this is maps. Maps of the world are great tools for just getting that physical picture in your mind of the world. I'm going to show you a, a resource called World Mapper. And the way World Mapper works is it distorts images of countries based on a question or topic of interest. So the first topic we're going to show is um, population. So you can see the map of the world. You can see China and India here are really highly distorted based on their large population. So you can, you know, the countries are kind of literally swelling in size. Um, let me show you a, a second map um, based on income. So this map is a map of people making more than $200 a day. So again, you can see here very dynamically and, visit and uh, in a very visual way the distortion here, mostly in the U.S., but again, a lot of other countries in the world, you can see a lot of countries in Europe. Um, also the opposite, the countries that kind of disappear, most of the African continent. Um, also India is right here, like a little sliver. The flip side of this coin, people making less than $10 a day. You can see again here in a visual way, very easily, the disparity of wealth in our world. You can use World Mapper to kind of illuminate topics for even really young kids. So you can imagine saying to them, bring in a plastic toy, a plastic toy from home, and turn it over. Where do you think it's, what do you think it's going to say in the bottom? Maybe made in China? So this is a map showing toy exports. And you can see here the, that China is huge, huge in the map, almost the only player in the game. If you look at tour imports, there's a reason why these toys are all in our homes, these plastic goods are all in our homes. We're buying them. If you look at toy imports, um, again, there's some other countries who are pretty high up, but the U.S. here is swollen full of all these plastic toys from China. <laughs> um, and someone asked about the side with the title World Mapper. I'm going to type it into the chat room right there, worldmapper.org. Um, also, I just want to quickly mention for a great reading context builder is Google Lit Trips. And this is a uh, website that pairs pieces of literature with Google Earth so you can travel on virtual tours around the world as you're reading um, internationally themed books. And finally, because I want every subject covered, there's a great website called Global Math Stories. Um, again, and the website for this one is at the bottom, globalmathstories.org where they have stories from around the world that ha are paired with math problems at all levels. So you can see here, these are really elementary um, age math questions, but they have also, um, they have statistics questions, they have word problems that are very complex, you can get into high school math as well. Um, and what they do is they, they have pictures, they tell you a story about something called stilt fishing in Sri Lanka. And then you can explain the story, the content is all there for you, and then you relate it to math questions that are already plugged in um, into the website. And the great thing about this is it teaches your students something about the world while they're learning about math. And the idea being that if they're learning something kind of cool and interesting, like about these this bizarre fishing practice they've never heard of, that they might actually remember the math a little bit better because their, their brain remembers um, that they're interested in the story. So that's global math stories. And finally, in just my last couple of minutes, um, I want to share with you two great contact sites. Contact is how you add that personal human component to what you're teaching. If you want to make connections with um, folks living internationally, the Peace Corps has great contacts through World Life Schools, which is a wonderful resource for teachers, so definitely check that out. Um, and another resource I want to recommend is Post Crossing. Post Crossing is a good elementary resource that is, um, it's postcrossing.com is the website. Um, but what you do is you sign up for a free account and you can enter your profile, say I'm a teacher from Minnesota and I'm, I teach fourth grade and we would love to know more about your city. And you'll get postcards sent to you from all over the world and your class can send them out as well. The only cost is the cost of the postcard and the stamp. Um, and you'll, these are, you get physical postcards. These are the pictures of the postcards that I've received that I just scanned into my computer and, and put um, onto this PowerPoint. But you get physical postcards as well. And it's really fun. It's really fun to get um, those postcards in the mail. And someone asked if I have a slide with all these resources. I don't, but I can email you a handout that I have. And my email is on the last slide, and I'm also putting it here. So feel free to email me, and I will send you a handout of all these resources. 
The last level is just this individual level of global readiness. Um, we approach that here at Worldview, my organization at the UNC at Chapel Hill, by helping to prepare teachers. We provide professional development, we do conduct webinars, we go into schools, we have um, just meetings and um, phone and email consulting to try to help prepare teachers of all disciplines, all grade levels to infuse global components into their classrooms. Um, we have a lot of programming throughout the year that I welcome you to check out more about on our website. Um, and we also have a Facebook and a Twitter and a Pinterest handle, or a Pinterest account, um, Twitter handle, Facebook account that you can check out as well if you're into social media. And as I said, please feel free to email me, uh, log on to our website to learn more about Worldview, and enjoy the rest of the program. I'm so glad to be a part of it.